the Oi region Pokemon games were the two games that took the normal Pokemon 8 gym Elite 4 script, crumpled it up, threw it out the window. Instead they give you a go-go gadget bionicle arm and tell you to go rob the enemy team of genetically modified super Pokemon called Shadow Pokemon, befriend them, helping them return to their normal state. Now as cool and fun as all these Shadow Pokemon are, I do not promote these nefarious and diabolical acts. So I want to see if I can beat Pokemon XD Gale Darkness using only wild Pokemon. Okay, okay, freeze. A lot of you are probably already realizing, Ricky, you can't even catch wild Pokemon until after the first boss. And you are correct. So we are going to name the beginning of this game through that first boss, the Prologue, which will host its own set of challenges. In the Prologue, we do have one technical wall Pokemon we can use, and that's our starter Eevee. Now we didn't catch this Pokemon, but it was in the wild at one point in its life, so we're going to roll with it. Our Eevee is the only Pokemon on our team that is allowed to do direct damage. I will allow the use of early game shadow Pokemon for items, status inflicting moves, and for me to throw Pokeballs at other shadow Pokemon with, however no direct damage from those Pokemon. Also, if Eevee is defeated, we just throw the battle right then and there. Once we catch our first wild Pokemon, every single other Pokemon in our party must be deposited at that point, and that is where our prologue challenge will end. Without further ado, let's jump into this epic adventure. We named ourselves Wilbert for obvious reasons and check our Eevee's nature to see if we have a calm nature, which is probably one of the better natures we could have gotten seeing as we need this Eevee to be super tanky. After a bunch of running around and dealing with whatever the fuck this kid is, we head back to our lab to obtain our go-go gadget arm and are shortly later introduced to the antagonist of the game and given our first opportunity to do what every kid has tried to do in every Pokemon game ever. Steal Pokemon from trainers. And this is awesome because I love robbing people. Allegedly. Anyway, this setup we got is still as awesome as I remember. We have a literal scouter. Call us Vegeta. Anyway, our dad gets robbed. Wait. He's not our dad. Who the fuck is our dad? Oh, well, not important. We get our first real mission and go into Gadion Port, which actually has a lot of good stuff for us. We get to Gadion Port and we bump into Johnny Bravo, who's currently in the middle of a roid rage. He flexes his shadow Zangoose on us, but before we get a chance to rob him, these three guys who have way too much detail to be normal NPCs step in. Wait. Dad? Is that you? Anyway, Buddy brings out an Alakazam and we all know how this ends, but look at this man's smile. This is actually the face of evil right now, someone who is comfortable committing heinous crimes and moving on about his day like he's the MC. After that gets cleaned up, we talk to this guy who's an Eevee enthusiast and will give us a stone to evolve our Eevee into one of the first five evolutions. Now, anyone who's played this game knows Jolteon is undoubtedly the best choice. However, this isn't a normal playthrough. We need a Pokemon that can do damage and take a bunch of hits. So for that, I chose Umbreon. He's the tankiest by far. And we already have the move Bite, which at 60 power plus stab and the potential to flinch is by far the best move we're gonna have for this early portion of the game. It doesn't stop there though, because there are two shadow Pokemon we can nab early in this area. A Poochyana who's kind of useless and a Lediba, who for once in his miserable, pathetic life will actually be useful once he attains Supersonic. After Gadion, we get sent to a gate village to learn the OG way of purifying Pokemon. And this battle right here quickly made me realize how rough this challenge is going to be just relying on an Eevee to do damage. However, we don't need to suffer long because in the second battle of this cave, we not only unlock Supersonic for Lediba, but we evolve Eevee into Umbreon, giving us a huge power spike. And look at those defenses. This is going to be a breeze now. After our battle with the Ash Catch and Wannabe, we get told about Mount Battle. If you played these games before, you know how brutally tedious this area is. However, we're just here for the story stuff. But first, Dad! 
The man we're looking for isn't far, so after a few easy battles, we see... Wait, is that my dad? Anyway, he gives us information about where our science dad is, since the police are useless as always. We decide to take matters into our own hands and go save him ourselves. Beating the Cypher base is the last stretch before we access the wild Pokemon. But first and foremost... These guys are goofy, but they could prove to be menacing with six very strong shadow Pokemon for this point of the game. One in particular, Mareep, is going to be a huge asset due to the move Thunder Wave. This is going to virtually replace Lediba, and just like that, his time in the spotlight is all but over. Also, fuck this green guy. Why do you have to be that guy with five weak ass Pokemon? Anyway, with all that done, let's head inside. Yeah, the music in this place is still goaded. We storm through here, catching all the shadows along the way. Also, Coliseum vets will know exactly what this button does. We run into our first complication here due to a matchup and a Makuhita. We actually lose Umbreon here, and by rule, we should lose the battle. But seeing as both Pokemon are paralyzed, Feebas is literally useless, and Makuhita is doing one damage about every three turns, I'm just going to revive Umbreon, we're going to let this one slide. No worries though, because barely 30 minutes later, I forget to go heal, I go into this battle with 1 HP. And I wipe for real this time, I'm as a bitch. I also completely forgot this Carvana has black glasses, which would have been a nice power up to bite, but we didn't need it in the end. Anyway, Professor Scraggy's trying to use Takno Jutsu on the Cypher Peon. It almost worked until the vision of us triggered this man's PTSD and he tried to get us back for robbing him. It didn't work. But now it's time for the boss, Big Bad Lavrina herself. And yo, her hair makes me want to go get a tricep pump real quick. I could have made a kinky hair pulling joke here, but come on y'all, it's a Pokemon game. And I'll probably do enough of that by the end of this video. The battle went pretty smooth, and I guess this is a cool time to talk about my past experiences of the game. At a fresh age of 10 years old, in the midst of my gaming prime, I was the kid who used one Pokemon through an entire playthrough. In this game being double battles, I used two. Can you guess what that iconic duo was? Flareon and Delcaddy. And as you know, these are two very substandard Pokemon. I don't know how I beat this game. But I did. I even beat the first round of the Ori Coliseum, which a lot of you know is very difficult. Delcaddy had Ice Beam and Shockwave. Why? I don't know. It worked though. Anyway, she's defeated. We head back. All's good in the world. We get sent to Pirate Town, which by the way has the best theme of all time, and have one last bit of errands to run before we unlock our true team. Honestly, I got lost here for a little bit, but it's okay, because after spending four and a half hours of biting every Pokemon I've seen, we are able to meet up with Dunking and begin catching our wild Pokemon, thus completing the prologue of this challenge. Now that we are at the Poke Spots, we can officially begin chapter one of this challenge run, and there's a lot to talk about, so bear with me. Let's start with the process of catching Pokemon. So Dunking here will hand us 10 of these things called Poke Snacks. We put down the snacks on the plate and we leave the area for a bit, wait for a handy dandy scouter to notify us and come back for a wild encounter. The more snacks we put down, the longer the Pokemon will stay. However, we're gonna be devoting all of our attention to this so we can get away with just putting one snack per encounter. Now, there are three different Poke Spots in the game, however, we only have access to the first two for now. 
that's because, spoiler alerts, there's an unavoidable boss fight you get at the third one before you can even take advantage of it. So, we have to make a team from areas 1 and 2 to fight said boss. To make matters even more complicated, we only get 10 of these Poke Snacks until we complete the next story mission. Which means if we want to reap the benefits of the cave spot, we're going to have to make a team from the first two spots with limited supplies. It just can't be easy, can it? Let's start diving into the Pokemon we can actually attain. From the first spot, the rock area, we can get a sand true, which evolving into a sand slash becomes more of just a physical specimen. We can get a Gligar, which is not as strong as sand true and unfortunately doesn't have its evolution in this game, but it has an interesting type and it's a pretty strong option early on. And we can get trap pinch, which evolving into a flygon could be a really nice jack of all trades and something we need to keep our eyes on. Over in the Oasis, we start out with Fampy, which stat-wise, it's just a better Sand Slash. And move-wise, it actually gets a pretty interesting move set that we could take advantage of later on in our run. Secondly, there's Hopip. Now, usually Hopip is a worthless Pokemon. In this instance, though, it's a pretty good speedy tank, and it's gonna be the best setup Pokemon we might actually be able to obtain in the entirety of the game, but solely in this wild Pokemon challenge for sure. And lastly, Surskit, which has a pretty good ability in Intimidate once it evolves, and if we hold off on evolving into level 25, we'll get Bubble Beam, which is a really nice stab option on a move that we're not gonna have much coverage of otherwise. It's also fair to mention that Dunking will talk about three trade options for the rare Pokemon of each area. I thought long and hard about if I was going to be able to use these, if I was going to be able to use one of them, or what I was going to do. Ultimately, I just decided on not using any trade Pokemon for the integrity of the challenge. As much as I wanted to make you can't fuckle with the shuckle jokes, we're going to bypass it this run. So I used 7 of our 10 Poke Snacks, and I got pretty lucky with the haul. We got a really strong Sandshrew and Gligar. We also got a Fampy and a Hoppip. I ended up training up the Hoppip on optional trainers to evolve it into a Skip Plume, but more importantly to put Stun Spore and Sleep Powder onto it. And the Gligar and Sandshrew are pretty much ready to go for the boss fight, so without further ado, let's take on one of the most legendary trainers in all of Pokemon. This fight went about as perfect as it possibly could have. Skiploom's job was to sleep powder everything, Gliger's job was to damage everything. We ended up only taking two attacks the entire fight. And after all the pain and suffering we did to get here, we were about to reap the rewards of the third Poke Spot. First, let's talk about the Pokemon. We got Aeron, an extremely bulky physical specimen of a Pokemon with the typing to support the stats. Secondly, we got Zubat. Now, this is probably the most annoying Pokemon in everybody's existence. And if you think that, you've never used a Crobat. Because Crobat is one of the best speedsters in Pokemon. I don't care what anyone says, it is one of the best. And lastly, oh lastly, my favorite Pokemon of all time, Wooper. Once evolved into a Quagsire, this little guy is blessed with the water ground type, making it only weak to grass. So it's safe to say, we're using all three Pokemon from the cave spot, along with Skip Bloom because I feel like he proved his worth more than enough in the battle against Meyer B. The rest of the team at this point is still up in the air for me. There are a couple Pokemon I'm eyeing, but after doing a little research, I can see that any Pokemon can really fit in and do a decent job on this team. Anyway, I used two of the three Poke Snacks to obtain a Zubat and an Aeron. I left the other one down, but it's been about three hours of just grinding for wild Pokemon. 
I'm really super motivated to actually play this game with more than one Pokemon <laughs> using an attacking move. So we're going to let that snack be and we're going to go deal with the next ordeal and that waits for us back in Pirate Town. Thus, we begun our attempt to thwart Cypher's takeover, but early on we realized we forgot to restock on Pokeballs, and this was like an omen because as I was leaving, the spot monitor went off, and going to check on that, we run into another Zubat, far more powerful than the one we already have, also coming equipped with wing attacks, so we made the switcheroo, we stocked up, returned back to the OBNS station, where Cypher surely had enough time to relay the message of our presence, and in reality, do whatever the hell they're here to do. Now even with a full team, I noticed my damage output was still lackluster to say the least. But just like in the prologue, the second I start complaining about the damage, our Zubat evolves turning his pathetic stats into one that resembles a BAMP. With that upgrade, Golbat single handedly carried us through the majority of this area. And if you guys are wondering about any story implications of this area, basically that data ROM we got back at the HQ. They wanted that shit back, and they came prepared too because not only did they take that shit back, they also wiped our shit clean. Talk about being one step ahead. Unfortunately, we were not able to obtain the data ROM even though we beat big old bro Leisha over there, but we did get word to go investigate Fennec City which strangely has gone off the grid as of late. Before we head over there though, we are now able to buy Poke Snacks from the store, so we stock up on about 30 of them and fill up all the spots seeing as we still have a couple of valuable team members to add. The second we step foot in the beautiful Utopia of Fennec, we are given a game case and told to go to Railing Game Tower to play some games. Now normally I'm a man who likes to take care of the important business first, but since she made a compelling argument and literally kicked me out of the area. Let's go play some games! Now, the real reason why I'm here is not to indulge in Pokemon's finest mini games, but it was honestly just to kill some time. The three Pokemon we still need to obtain are Trapinch, Surskit, and Wooper, which are the rare Pokemon of each of the wild areas spawning at about 15%. So, I guess while we're playing some Battle Bingo, we might as well go into how the hell does this wild area stuff work? So, bear with me because the research I did was very limited just because there's not much talked about with these areas. Really all I could find was that the second you place down a Poke Snack, the game already predetermines what wild Pokemon is going to spawn next at that spot. So there's no saving and resetting every time going into an area hoping you get a different Pokemon. Also, when you put down a Poke Snack, what happens is a little timer starts ticking down. Now this timer supposedly will only tick down if you're walking or in a Pokemon battle. So hence why I thought coming here would be the perfect way to kill time. Luckily though, our stay at Rail Game Tower wasn't long because our spot monitor went off and at first we went to the Oasis for a Munchlax encounter which was a little teaser for Gen 4 way back in the day. And secondly, we struck gold at the cave spot. Now, good news, obviously, we have a freaking Wooper, the best Pokemon ever created. Bad news is, it is on the weak side. On the bright side, this gives us a perfect opportunity to head back to the Pirate Coliseum for some good TMs and some good experience for our little guy. While doing this, we actually got our Skip Plume level 22, giving it Leech Seed. And I'm going to make a bold prediction right now. Skip Plume will be the team MVP by the end of this run. I know it sounds silly for a Pokemon with no attacking moves to be named the MVP, but trust me, I see potential in this little guy. So with the four Coliseum Challenge defeated, we head back to Relegam, scoop up some TMs for later. Unfortunately, we didn't get lucky with any other Pokemon. However, I feel pretty strong about our solid four plus Gligar and Sandslash. I think we're ready to get back to business in Fennec, which just so you guys know, is my absolute favorite part of this game. Now this place is just creepy. The people are odd, the music has this sick little sinister twist to it. 
If you played Pokemon Coliseum, you already know what's wrong here. So our mission is to go to the mayor's house, and we have to distract this maid lady with some music. We head upstairs, and as we head up there, the music dims, and there's a note detailing that the worst might have already happened, and Cypher basically bossing saved this place and took over without anybody even knowing. Unfortunately, as we figure out the truth, we play right in the Cypher's hands, ambushed by the maid lady who keeps calling us little boy. Not gonna touch that one. But I do want to talk about the fact that Cypher means business in this game. We can all agree that Pokemon Coliseum was the edgier of the two GameCube versions of Pokemon, but Cypher like really means business in this game. They literally took over a town and impersonated the population so nobody would think the town is taken over. That's Lex level shit. And what if I told you? It gets worse. Can you see why this place is my favorite yet? Humongous tip, the house you get the music disc in has a bed you can rest in. During our rematches with the Power Rangers, we ended up getting a notification back for the rock pokey spot and got a nice surprise there. Let's go! Also, Wooper evolved. Back to the problem at hand, the whole city is infested with Cypher. The weirdo lady at the front Cypher. The jogger with the dust skull? Cypher. The guy with an absol? The Pokemon of disaster? Cypher. The shop clerk? Also a Cypher. There are a few people that are just confused and don't know what's going on, but I'm sure they would have been abducted by Cypher too if we didn't show up when we did. So while clearing the outside, I taught Quagsire Blizzard, and he also learned Amnesia through his own turning him into a little powerhouse and all in all the whole team is really getting stronger and coming together. So we finally head to the pre-gym in searches for Justy, where we finally start encountering Shadow Pokemon which must mean we're going the right direction. We make it to Justy's 8th twin and this guy using double team gave me PTSD of the Coliseum battle with the real Justy. Let's just not talk about that. We find out the mayor and the residents are locked in the basement, I promise you guys it's not as bad as it sounds, and that this guy is nowhere near important enough to have the key for that. So only one place remains, guarded by an old man in a nutsleaf, just kidding it's another cypher, we head into the main attraction of Fennec, which is the stadium, which due to the abundance of shadow pokemon trainers, for plot purposes, this must be the right direction. Also, Skip Plume evolved. Perfect timing. We finally make it to the end where the big boss is, and guys, this might be the biggest excuse for a boss I have ever seen in my life. Like, come on now. Lorvina was bad, but at least the music fit her. This just makes me uncomfortable. Anyway, we have to fight the lackey first. And then we go into the boss battle. I'm gonna save y'all a little bit of time and just let you know we white it out in the boss fight because we were unprepared. Rematch with Freak Show. This guy is still no pushover even though we're coming in prepared. His Pokemon have very versatile move sets and a lot of coverage for weaknesses. So starting out we're gonna get a sleep powder off on the Quagsire which is very important because that Quagsire is big trouble so we want to keep it out of commission as much as possible. Our main objective is to chunk down that lantern and kind of 1v2 hit that side of the field. We take down the lantern with little to no problem and then he goes into a shadow lunatone. This comes equipped with shadow sky, a weather based shadow moves whose sole purpose is to double the lengths of battles. 
This is also where the bullshit crit started coming into play. I pretty much ended up trading my Quagsire and Jump Pluff for his Quagsire. He sends out cast form when we send out Aeron and Golbat. I just want to talk about how they missed a perfect opportunity to have cast form turn into a shadow Pokemon due to this, his special effect in the weather based shadow sky. That would have been sick. Anyway, remember when I said this is the start of the bullshit crits? Yeah. That sucks. I kind of go for a Hail Mary on this turn with an Ultra Ball, hoping I can get a KO on the cast form and catch the Lunatone. And it actually worked. He sends out his last Pokemon, which is a Matang, which is always a problem to deal with, especially when they're getting critical hits on you. Luckily though, we get one back, but it ends up coming down to the initial duo of Sandslash and Gligar that started it all. That duo is the duo that ended Cypher's plan and won us the battle. Won us the battle. Now, of course, these two here are going to put everything they just saw on the news. I can't see that backfiring at all later. But before we leave, we remember to grab Ice Beam. That's going to be a lot useful for later. And I guess we can rescue the citizens real quick. But look at the place they're locked up in. Like I said, it was not that bad. To finish up Chapter 1, we head over to the mayor's house, obtaining the XP share, a perfect item to help get a new team member into the swing of things. With Fennec City saved, and 8 of the 9 wild Pokemon obtained, I can safely say Chapter 1 has been completed. After a heroics in Fennec, it was finally time to bring the battle to Cypher. Justy told us he saw something out in the desert, so we try to head over there and due to plot purposes we cannot traverse the desert with our moped. So conveniently when we get back we get a text to head over to OBNS and help a guy find his bonds lie which is another gen 4 teaser. Also second net mentioned they have a friend named Purr who is over in Gadian Port who might be able to help us get through the desert. So back over at Gadian Port, unfortunately Purr's grandfather's over at Dr. Kamiko's house so we have to go fetch him. And right on cue, the news clip comes on showing that we defeated the Freak Show back at Fennec. And not a moment later, we're visited by... Dad! So we head over to Dr. Kimiko's house and once again we are accused of being burglars. And once again we wreck Chogan shit. However, unfortunately, our little sister isn't here to protect us this time. So we're subjected to one of the most epic boss fights in Pokemon history. change there buddy. We find grandpa, bring him back, he upgrades our scooter, allowing us to traverse our ways into the deeper desert. And guys, we are stunting now. Ah, uh, remember this thing from the beginning of the game? This place revolves around the equivalent of a strength puzzle. And trust me, it's gonna make you rage. Now, this place seems all but abandoned until... I got a rant right here. I cannot stand this fruity teen girl bop music. Like, it worked for Lavina. It does not work for a big scary bodybuilder plumber crossbreed. Anyway, this dude encapsulates the stereotype of enemy teens always being dumb. They're always dumb. This guy literally just stated that not only did we defeat Snaddle, the cypher admin, we also single-handedly overtook the entire city of Fennec. And he's like, okay, I'm just gonna leave my two peons to deal with you. I'll just never understand. Either way, we're gonna chalk this up as a cypher victory making us 4-0. Oh. 
So we meet a homeless guy who is scared of some big bad noise, so he sends a little 10 year old boy to investigate. We get a notification from our spot monitor, but more importantly we learn that this is where the bonds live we were looking for is, and wow, that was really easy. Usually everything's like a three step process where I have to go out of my way to- Mother fucker. Anyway, after that, I think it's time we took our leave, but it can never be that easy because now we have the introduction of Team Snagum and Team Snagum, Team Schmagum, we're gonna beat them like we beat everyone else in this- Wait, you don't wanna battle me? You're just gonna put me to sleep with your gloom? And then rob me of my snag machine? Honestly? A plus performance, these guys did the rare thing in video games where instead of just throwing yourself into a battle against a main character with ungodly amount of plot armor, you just use your Pokemon to attack me. Good job. And it's also a good thing we got sent back here because our homeless friend forgot to mention a whole ass Pokemon factory out in the desert we saw a little bit away from here. So now we got an objective to go to. Now, like I said before, I'm a man that likes to take care of the important things first, and obviously a Cypher Pokemon factory is pretty important. However, that spot monitor went off, we need to go check what that is. And what a perfect timing for this little guy to come join the roster, not only completing the wild Pokemon decks, but filling out the last spot on the team. We gotta train him up a little bit but I'm really happy to have him along. Now it's time to go deal with Cypher. We make our way to the factory and look who it is, Johnny Bravo in the midst of another Roid Rage. Now I'm chilling with my bag of popcorn watching Roid Rage Bravo take it to the scrubs who just jumped us back at the ship. But alas, it is finally time for our long awaited battle with Zook. And this is the first instance of a shadow Pokemon we can't catch. It's just such an empty feeling. I play this game to rob other trainers, but now I can't. Now I just feel powerless. Oh well. We try to storm the entrance, but these bodybuilders win the 200 IQ award by not battling us and just standing in our way. And I guess that's it. There's nothing else we can do. I guess we just go home and go back to OBNS. So we learn a little bit more about the factory and learn that one of their friends was able to run off with one of the shadow Pokemon they made and they want us to go retrieve it. So it's time to go to the bar. And upon arrival, our mirror radar goes off and before we can even enter, the legend himself confronts us for yet again another battle. And unfortunately, he has a shadow Pokemon too that we can't catch. Oh well, we got to hear some good music again, and that's always a win in my book. We go inside and meet up with the scientist who gives us a shadow Togepi. It's worth mentioning that if we purify this Togepi, you can actually trade it for an Elekid. And that Elekid is absolutely broken. But again, we're not using trade Pokemon, so we're not going to worry about it. Now the boys back over at OBNS are coming in clutch and found Snagum's hideout, and I just want to point out that from the end of Fennec to here, the only required fights were two boss fights, two mini bosses, and this guy. Oh well, anyway, we're at Snagum's hideout and luckily there is no shadow Pokemon here. However, the trainers are pretty strong. So while battling these guys, Surskate got the level 25 and learned Bubble Beam. Once I evolved it, I also taught it Ice Beam, which hopefully will give us a nice special counterpart to our mostly physically dominant team. To make a long story short, we wrecked everyone. Aaron got Iron Tail, which is a much needed power boost, and I also learned that if a Pokemon uses Taunt against Skip Plume, it uses Struggle because it has no attacking moves. Hmm, the more you know. Now it's time to face the boss, however this is a lot like Fennec where you have to battle a lackey right before the boss, and the first battle was no problem, but the boss on the other hand, yeah that was tragic. 
rematch time with Big Daddy Guns up, we take full advantage of the grimiest, slimiest, most despicable plays, and that's spamming Sleep Powder. We're able to take out Electrode early on, and both of the Grass users are asleep. I start spamming Blizzards, and then we get hit with a taste of our own medicine, so we take a turn to switch out and get our shit together. Then go back to our nefarious Sleep Powder spam, and honestly, this is how the rest of the battle went. Once a Pokemon woke up, I put it back to sleep. And thanks to the play that would make a small child throw his Game Boy across the room, we defeat Gonzap and require our tool for Grand Theft. Also, we get a key for the TM Shadow Ball, which in Gen 3 is still a physical move, so we ended up giving it the gold bat. Back at the factory and Johnny Bravo is on another roid rage, but maybe he should have gave some to his team because they are literally exactly the same as before. We beat him and rob him, and with a clear entrance to the factory, we do the only sensible thing. Listen guys, the radar went off. Back at the factory, you make a beeline for the entrance. However, it just can't ever be easy. But wait, for once things finally go our way, and we have a clear way to the entrance again. Being the main production plant for Shadow Pokemon, this place is littered with Cypher as you can imagine. This is actually the introduction to trainers having multiple Shadow Pokemon at once, which was kind of nice. It grouped the Shadow Pokemon trainers to a select few and made most of the trainers just have regular Pokemon, which allowed me to mindlessly murder all of them and then play smart against just a select few trainers. So in terms of team progression, we finally made a few strides. Trapinch finally evolved into Vibrava, and I knew this evolution was technically weaker, but from this evolution we also get a stab option in Dragon Breath. And besides that, until we made it to the rooftop, we kind of just stormed through this place with no problem at all. Things got a little spicy at the top though. Aeron finally evolves into Leiron, which is a big time evolution, and this isn't even his final form. And then we are gifted with Earthquake, one of the few good TMs I can actually use. Now, I thought long and hard about who gets it, and I decided to give it to Leiron, simply because four team members are just straight up immune to it. And Quagsire is a freaking tank. It'll get hit by it, and he'll probably just smile and just be like, Quagsire! So we system restart the factory and we are ready to take out the big boss and honestly this could be a pretty intimidating fight if we weren't the ultimate counter to him. This guy runs the earthquake protect strategy but remember 66.666% of my team is immune to earthquake and the scumminess was on my side and what I mean by that is this fight could not have gone any more perfect for me. Every single sleep powder was hitting and we were just sweeping through his team at this point. We did end up taking an unfortunate casualty to an iron tail, but the momentum was already so far in our favor I really didn't worry too much about it. However, we did kind of dig ourselves a little grave by sending out both of his shadow Pokemon at once. It was a little scary, but we did manage to weaken him down the optimal catching range, and a huge shout out to Ultra Balls. This place was a cinch with the wild Pokemon thanks to just me spamming Ultra Balls instead of being stubborn and usually doing the Pokeball method. Mr. Clean's defeated, and look who it is. The old man revealing that he's the true evil mastermind behind Cypher. Who could have guessed? He threatens us a little bit, but that's not going to take away our shine that we, a 10 year old boy, thwarted Cypher's plans once again, and I think, at this point, we can call Chapter 2, completed. Beginning of the final chapter in our story, we're at a little bit of a weird spot. We have nothing to go off of except for Greville gloating about his island being impenetrable and we can't get to it any way possible. However, if you remember back at Dr. Kamiko's house, which fun fact, if you go back there after Gorgon, you can rematch the Robo Groudon. Team's a little bit stronger and the Groudon has a reclining chair. 
Anyway, back to the main story. We have to head over to Gadion Port and you want to talk to Purr's grandfather. If you remember, he acquired the Robo Kyogre from Dr. Kamiko and he's more than willing to give his super cool speedboat to a 10 year old. I mean, I guess we are single handedly defeating a crime syndicate, but it's awfully generous of him. Before we head off on our final bout though, I want to shore up the team's moveset a little bit. We headed over the rail game tower because for beating the second round of the Coliseum there, you get the TM for Giga Drain, which I think could be pretty handy for a Pokemon. We then head over to a gate because there's actually a move tutor here. I went ahead and taught Layron Double Edge, Quagsire Body Slam, and I gave Masquerade Nightmare. I don't know if this is going to be helpful, but I thought with how much we use Jump Plus as Sleep Powder, it might come in handy. Surprisingly enough, I actually use Giga Drain on Vibrava. I originally was going to use this for Jump Puff, but Jump Puff already excels in the Sleep Powder Leech Seed role, and once Vibrava evolves, it has a nice special attack stat, and it also has a special attack nature. Now that we are thoroughly prepared, we are ready to 1v100 Cypher, and trust me, I'm not even exaggerating. Now first off, I want to give my applause to this final area. This place is huge. I think it took me like four or five hours to get all the way through it. And this is how you do a final area. Battles on top of battles and they're not weak battles. Like these are a lot of five, six team trainers with fully evolved Pokemon that could potentially mess you up. We have a couple of goals in mind. I want to evolve Vibrava first and foremost and then later on. And for the love of God, I would love to evolve Golbat. Friendship evolutions are such a bitch. Also, I want Quagsire to hit level 42 because that's when he learns Earthquake and why wouldn't I want to have another Earthquake spammer? Look who it is. Now, you know I hate this fruity team bop music, but at least it fits her. Rematch time against Lavrina, and I'm not gonna lie, I was not ready for the absolute ass blasting pause that she gave me. We wide it out. Round two with Little Miss Popstar, we are far more prepared to handle her fearsome duo. I deal with everybody's waifu the best way possible. And that's with a fat shadow ball to the ch I'm not even gonna try to not make that sound sexual. We make use of Giga Drain and Chunk the Gorobis, who starts flirting with Golbat, and unfortunately he's a simp, but we take out the Thoughtfish, and then we clean up some weeds, unveiling her two Shadow Pokemon. We have a little bit of a panic attack crit here, but on the bright side, it all worked out. We robbed her once, roofied her Altaria, and robbed her twice. And I just want to point out, Lavrina looks like that one girl who got famous off of selling bathwater. You guys know who I'm talking about. We got a lot of trainers to fight. I think now is honestly a good time to kind of just talk about the journey and why this run has just been so awesome. Firstly, let's talk about the team. So I've used an Agron, a Flygon, a Golbat slash a Crobat before, and of course they're all well-known great Pokemon. Quagsire is my literal favorite, so it's always a treat to use him. But the two oddballs, Masquerade and Jump Pluff, are two Pokemon I would never catch myself dead using. Unless I put myself in a scenario like this. Truthfully, I'm glad I did. Don't get me wrong, Masquerade is decent at best. It is slow as hell, by the way, guys. Like, I didn't realize how slow it was. I was under the impression it was actually kind of fast. But no, it was not. It was very slow. It was a pretty decent special wall though. But Jump Bluff? Boy, oh boy, did I sleep on this little guy. Now, I knew it was fast, and I knew it was especially bulky, but I was always like, well, it can't really do anything. And in the general 1v1 sense, it probably isn't that good. But being able to get a sleep powder off before virtually anything, and then leech seeding things while it's sleeping like it was so scummy don't get me wrong i felt dirty every single time i did it but i promise you this i was cheesing 
every single time I did it because I was thinking like as a kid I struggled with these battles because I was the general move do damage me use move move do more damage me use move more move don't do damage me never use move that was my philosophy now that I am a full-grown man and can read move descriptions I have learned that stall moves stats infliction moves and setup moves are key are absolutely key to where jump pluff a pokemon that has no attacking moves is the mvp of our team up until this point and i truthfully think through the rest of the series will be the mvp of this team another really cool thing about this run is that i used eight out of nine of the usable pokemon in meaningful ways obviously we have our team of six and then Glygor and Slant Slash, you gotta remember, they carried us to the beginning. And they even were the team that put the end to Snaddle. Like, I don't win that fight if I don't have those two at the end to take down the Matang. Unfortunately, Fampy didn't get any time in the spotlight. It's a shame because, like I said, Defense Curl, Rollout, and Earthquake, it could have been formidable. It was just a project that I never had to begin I never had a need to because of how well the team synergized together. But to recap at the end of all the battles, by Brava Evolved, we taught it Flamethrower and it is by far the ace of the team. Laron Evolved and is an absolute fortress. Not the Pokemon, I mean like he is a literal freaking fortress. Golbat is still Golbat. I don't know why he hates me, but he does. And Quagsire learned Yawn, just when you think I couldn't be more scummy. Don't make a remark about the music. Don't make a remark about the music. <sighs> okay, rematch time with Snaddle. Honestly, this team is dangerous. I remember this fight giving me a lot of problems as a kid. And me not switching out my team definitely isn't a good start. But this was Flygon's coming out battle. Even though I switched him into an Ice Punch, good thing I have Giga Drain. And this is beyond satisfying. The one hit full HP recover and the anticipation knowing exactly what this scissor just got himself into. Burnt to a crisp, he switches into his soul rock which we get an early yawn on. We take the next few turns to weaken the soul rock and defeat the Matang and things honestly couldn't be going better. We capture the soul rock and we're left with just cast form and Starmie. We got tripped up a little bit losing Flygon, Jump Pluff, and Quagsire, but we regain momentum and deal with the cast form, rob ourselves of Starmie, and win the battle. Also, this is brutal game design. I love it. Next on our hit list is the menace to society himself, Ardos. And just look at that smile. You know this man is evil just for the fun of it. Now this battle is one I probably shouldn't have won. We learned early on that Jump Pluff is simply far too underleveled to really make an impact anymore. But his sacrifice was not in vain. We were able to trade with the Alakazam and then deal with Swellow who has this really cool move called Shadow Half that literally halves every single Pokemon on the field's HP. Luckily enough, Hydro Pump missed and we were able to get a Yawn off on Swellow. Not so lucky next turn, we do trade Agron for Kingdra, switching into Golbat and Heracross respectively. And I'm just cheesing because we all know what's about to happen. One robbing and one wing attack to the face. This is where things got tricky though. Dealing with Snorlax and Electabuzz, these are both very strong Shadow Pokemon and we were getting picked off so I made the executive decision to go for the win rather than the snag. If there's one thing I learned is don't jeopardize the win of a battle you weren't supposed to win in the attempt to get a capture. So we end up taking them both out, barely surviving though. Not a worry though, we will get an opportunity to get Snorlax and Electabuzz at a later date. So Grievel flexes his 200 IQ by instead of battling us, he blocks our way. And I'm telling you, once these enemy teams learn to not battle us, just block our way and don't allow us to run past a certain location, we're done for. 
Unfortunately, the elevator is also being used, so we're just done. Nothing else to do. Except leaving it up to Cypher to somehow fuck this up. And here is Gorgon, right on cue. Boasting the same strategy as before, our team still counters it pretty well. But he is still pretty strong. We managed to get a sleep powder off before Jump Pluff just gets nuked by an ice beam. Instantly, we do however get our revenge. And in my opinion, we completely take momentum of the entire fight. Because with the help of crit hacks, we one hit the aggron. Thanks to the earthquake spam, we knock out the ursarang. And to keep the chain going, we knock out the wallarang, leaving just the two shadows, Polyrath and Mr. Mime. And if you ever played Pokemon Rejuvenation, this Pokemon will give you nightmares. Not gonna think about that. Anyway, speaking of nightmares, the tide is definitely shifted. This duo is just as strong as the last duo we faced. Literally sweeping through most of our team, I made the same executive decision as I did last time where I just went for KOs. I chucked a few Hail Mary balls though and I got extremely lucky. With once again Golbat being the sole survivor, I had nothing but a prayer and a dream. And luckily, it was answered. And for the last time, we have to hear that stupid Team Bop theme. So there's one more random Cypher Peon remaining. We easily take care of him, but in the midst of our conquest, we get a Meyer notification. Now, like I said, I am a man of business and I would not jeopardize the mission. I couldn't resist, guys. Okay, the long-awaited match, and I'm not talking about Greevil, I'm talking about our dad. And instead of narrating the battle like I usually do, I'm gonna let the clip play while I talk about why I keep calling this man my dad. Also, I got extremely lucky in this fight. So unfortunately, there's really no in-game text or knowledge to support or deny my hypothesis as far as I'm aware of but I am almost certain Eldis is in fact our father. The only line of dialogue I know of is the Professor Crane saying how proud our father would be if he saw us complete the purification machine, whatever. And the thing is, I think he did know we completed it. I think Eldis left the laboratory once he saw they were on the right path to complete in the purification machine. He then went to go join Cypher, but not to aid in their cause, more or less to be the peace from the inside. Kind of like Atachi on the Akatsuki. I think his main objective was to try to prevent or at least delay whatever plan Cypher had by taking more peaceful, slow, safe routes, quote unquote. Now, the physical connection is close enough to make a resemblance. I mean, just look at both of them. Red hair, kind of spiky. Eldis obviously has more of a, you know, laid back haircut while we're pretty wild about it. Um, and also kind of thinking about it, Ardos and Jovi are like both blue and nope, 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 not opening that can of worms. But aside from the physical similarities, you always notice Eldis kind of takes a fond liking to you. He stays behind whenever the three depart, he made quick conversation with us at Mount Battle and always seemed to hold us in a high regard. Again, I have no dialogue or proof to support or deny any of these claims, just an hypothesis I formed while playing this game. Let me know what y'all think. Am I right? Am I dead wrong? I don't know. But to further my claim, Eldis also has a Shadow Salamence, which is the same exact level as the Salamence we used in the first battle simulation. Hmm. Anyway, we somehow defeated Eldis, and it is us and Greevil. However, taking a look at the team, I think we need to go train up a bit. That looks better. So, Greevil is an extremely hard boss fight, coming equipped with 7 total shadow Pokemon, 4 of them being legendaries, and we're starting off with Mr. Cover Athlete himself, Shadow Lugia. And guys, can we take a second to appreciate how fucking sick Lugia looks? My method for this was pretty cheesy. Sleep powder, ice beam to weaken it, get an accuracy boost with call, heal up, and repeat. I didn't want to waste my master ball here because I could trap Lugia in this infinite loop, 
And for those calling me cheap, go ahead. Rebel has seven Pokemon and four legendaries. I have a Jump Pluff and a Masquerade. I'm not losing any sleep over this, especially because how long this took. Over three resets and about 60 balls, an hour of chucking Ultra Balls, healing, and reapplying sleep. This reminded me of my childhood catching legendaries. We finally snag him, but then the true battle begins against his six other shadow Pokemon. Oh my god, it finally happened. I've been here for over an hour. Now, I had a plan going into this to do it over multiple attempts. Attempt 1 hopefully yielding Rhydon, Executor, Tauros, and I was going to use the Master Ball and Zapdos. Then I would come back and get the other two legendary birds on the second run. So let's see how well that plan holds. We jump right into it going straight to our tried and true formula of Sleep Powder and we get a pretty good lick out of Rhydon right off the bat. Moltres wakes up early and combined with Rhydon, Masquerain is quick to drop. We throw an Ultra Ball at Rhydon, acquiring him and putting Moltres back to sleep which is huge. Remember what I said about Jump Pluff being the MVP? This is why. I don't know if a lot of these battles go in our favor if we didn't have him putting everyone to sleep. Anyway, so a few turns of stalling and weakening and an unfortunate KO. We were slow playing this part of the fight really hard until I finally get an Ultra Ball to work and unleashing Tauros. But just like everything else, it's past its bedtime. Moltres wakes up just to go right back to sleep and we catch the Tauros with no issue at all. Out comes Articuno, and this was the setup I wasn't looking forward to because I didn't want to use a Master Ball on either of these two. And I also ran out of Sleep Powder, so we had to improvise for Paralysis. And at this point I'm kind of panicking, so before the Moltres wakes up, I wanted to take a risky ball throw. Oh, let's go! That's huge! That's so huge! Jump Pluff finally perishes, but with Zapdos out, we throw our Master Ball and continue to weaken the Articuno. And at this point, I was just looking for a KO, but I decided to attempt to catch her too while I had two Pokemon still out. Yo, let's go! Hey! All six in one run? Let's go! That was pretty cool. The perfect final boss run to seemingly end the challenge. We robbed a man, and our dad talked Grievel out of blowing up the island, killing tens and maybe about a hundred people. Anyway, everyone's all happy. They're celebrating our heroic return. We've captured all the shadow Pokemon, and our adventure is all but over, right? Wrong. There is one final shadow Pokemon and one final challenge we must overcome. And no, I'm not talking about Egan and the Or Coliseum. I'm not talking about purifying Lugia and all the shadow Pokemon to get the true final ending. I'm talking about battling the legend of the Or region one last time. Over in Gadian Port, we get a radar notification, and at the highest point, for all to see, we can have a battle truly fitted to be the last battle of our adventure against the legend himself. And hopefully we can have one last chance at evolving Golbat, because he is still a Golbat. Like, my guy, we have defeated hundreds of Cypher Peons, saved countless lives, and you still don't like me enough to evolve? So this truly was the final battle that we needed. This guy comes packing with five Ludicolos, all packing Swift Swim, and basically if they get that rain dance going, you're as good as done. I developed a strategy where I would confuse Ray one on the first turn, Sleep Powder the other, and pray to God that that confusion would work. If then, I would be able to set up and get two to three of the Ludicolos down, but I was never able to fully get them down. The sad thing is, I'm pretty sure if Golbat was a Crobat and had the speed boost that it had, this would have been so much easier. 
but instead we go back to our favorite six and we grind up for a little bit and we hope the little bit of strength boost that we've gotten is enough to help take down Meyer B. On the very last trainer I wanted to defeat, it finally happened. With Crobat in hand, I think we were powerful enough to go defeat Meyer B one last time. And the evolution is more big than you think. Obviously the stat boosts are great, but the fact that Crobat is now faster than Jump Pluff means I can set up Sleep Powders a lot more efficiently, meaning I can like KO a Pokemon and then Sleep Powder it before the turn's even over, which is huge. I also added a new wrinkle to my strategy in the use of Air Cutter. Air Cutter is a move that has 55 base power, so it's a little bit weaker than Wing Attack, but it has a high critical hit ratio. This didn't help us, but what did help us is that it's a multi-hitting move, which means it's going to hit both Blue Colo. If I use Air Cutter once, my wing attack is now strong enough to one-hit Ludi Colo. So if I was in situations where I couldn't KO Ludi Colo, or where I would KO a Ludicolo with just a little bit of chip damage, I would use Air Cutter to kind of keep a chain going to where I can KO the Ludicolos fast enough before they can wake up and get rain dances off. Now, I'm kind of getting wrecked a little bit here, but as long as Crobat survives, that's all we need. And luckily, the early rain dance went away, which allowed us to outspeed the Ludicolos and continue our chain of mass destruction. Now, with Dragonite out, this is kind of where I started panicking. I didn't know what to do at first. I did want to get rid of the Ludicolo, and I wanted to get a little bit of chip damage going off. I was hoping for a paralysis, but we didn't get it. The next turn was kind of dumb. Air Cutter was a smart move, but I just threw a Hail Mary ball for no reason. I had a plan in head, but I needed some specifics to happen. Unfortunately, we didn't get a lucky catch. But the specific happened and Flygon went down and we got out Masquerain. Now what I wanted to do was just some good old Parafusion. Paralyze and Confuse Ray and this actually worked really well. Dragonite hit itself in Confusion a couple of times weakening it and we didn't have to throw that many balls at it catching it on the second or third ball I believe. It is done ladies and gentlemen that is the finale of the pokemon xd gale of darkness wild only run i had a great time i love coming back playing these old games and adding harder stipulations to it making me use pokemon that i've never used before and i really don't know what else to say i'm not good at outros so i'm gonna make like Meyer b and skedaddle on out of here Hope you guys enjoyed, I'll see y'all next time.